Thank you, Cola. Uh, all right, so, um, so I'm going to be talking about um, some, some stuff that's, some of it's basic, some of it's more advanced. Most of it is, in fact, almost all of it is not my own work. It's other people's work. Um, so, uh, uh, and it's, uh, I'm not going to, I don't really have any long developments here. I have sort of individual topics that I could do in any order. They don't necessarily depend on each other. So I'm going to write down, I'm going to start right down on a list of things that we can do and maybe we can decide what we want to see first. So, um, so proof of the isolation lemma. This is when you, ha you, have a, you have an arbitrary set system and you assign weights to the, to the elements of the ground set randomly with a certain range. With high probability, there is a unique minimum weight set. So this is, this is crucial for lots of um, randomized, algorithm, randomized parallel algorithms for uh, matching and for matroid intersection, um, as well as um, some other things as well. Uh, that proof is not too terrible. Um, I'm going to do that. Um, there's also a lemma, uh, and it's, a, it's just purely combinatorial. The other one that's purely combinatorial, and one that I was going to give in my talk yesterday, but I didn't, was this uh, few cycles lemma. If you have a graph that omits cycles up to length r, then it can only have a polynomial number of cycles up to length 2r. Uh, so n to the fourth, in fact. And uh, um, so those, are, those don't have anything to do, those, these are more general than anything having to do with matching. I mean, those are just sort of pure combinatorial lemmas. Um, in terms of, as far as matching goes, there's, um, well, there's, I'm going to split it into two pieces, the bipartite, sort of bipartite stuff where we restrict ourselves to bipartite graphs and general graphs. So bipartite matching and uh, general matching. And I'm going to concentrate mostly on the unweighted, unweighted case, but um, I'll mention weighted matching at some point. Um, so for bipartite matching, uh, we have some algorithms. Uh, um, one to um, Carp and one due to Edmonds. These are, um, uh, I'm sorry, Edmonds is the general case. I got that wrong. Edmonds should be over here. Um, this is a fairly naive al algorithm, but it's polynomial time, so it, it, uh, it's, it's pretty easy. But it just shows that bipartite matching is in polynomial time. Um, Edmund's algorithm is polynomial time. Th these are both sequential algorithms. Edmund's algorithm is is more involved, and I won't I won't get that I won't get to that today, most likely. Okay. Um, there's another algorithm due to uh, uh, lineal. Um, some more. Titsky, I think, I'm not exactly sure, uh, and uh, Vigerson, um, using matrix scaling. I think this is more obscure. It was found after, it, it, um, this is was, this was from 2000, and it's actually worse than Karp's algorithm. Uh, or it, 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 I'm sorry, it's suboptimal in terms of running time, so probably people haven't heard of it. I'm thinking, but if, but it's so simple, it's amazingly simple and just pretty, so I just can't resist explaining it. Um, so I'm going to do that. 
and um, uh, and Maxwell. So this is, I think, Edmund's carp. Uh, okay. Um, some I want to uh, talk about the. Uh, I want to. I'll, I'll do Hall's theorem. Um, I'm guessing it's also called the marriage theorem. I'm guessing most of you know this. Okay. Um, maybe not all. Uh, I want to prove it, but I'm going to prove it in an indirect way by a proof that you probably haven't seen. There's a direct way of proving it. But then there's another way of proving it that also says something else interesting. And this is called the equisaturation theorem. Okay. And uh, finally do the connection to linear programming. So the perfect matching polytope um, uh, connection. Oh, equisaturation theorem going to Hall's theorem. Uh, connection to linear programming, the perfect matching polytope, why, uh, uh, why, it, why it's true, and why an optimal solution to the linear programming problem actually gives you a perfect matching. So there, there, there are a couple of different related questions here. There's, is there a perfect matching? Can you match up all the vertices with disjoint edges? Um, there's a maximum matching problem. Can you find a maximum cardinality matching? And um, there's also the weighted ma uh, uh, min weight matching problem, maybe, uh, or may call it max weight matching problem. Can you find a, um, a matching of maximum weight if the edges are given edge weights? All right, so on the, on the general side, um, I'll prove the... Um, so basically, the, the Edmonds, and then the parallel algorithm is um, uh, Svensson. Um, oh, there's, it, there, there's no H there. It's just Svensson, um, Tarnowski. I will not talk about this. This is very complicated. And, um, uh, but this is the parallel algorithm. Um, I can do the randomized algorithm. So the randomized algorithm, using the isolation lemma, that will be um, Mumuli uh, Vazirani, Vazirani and Vazirani. Um, that's not the first one historically, but it's the one that uses the isolation lemma. So I can, I can give that. I'm, uh, I more or less sketched it in, in the talk yesterday, but I could repeat it um, for people who weren't there. Um, so basic, basic things in general matching. Uh, if you have a non-max, if you have a non-max matching, this implies there exists an augmenting path. This is easy, but it forms the basis of lots of sequential maximum matching problems, including CARPs for bipartite and Edmonds for um, general. Um, some applications. Um, two processor scheduling. Uh, the Chinese postman problem. And um, uh, there's a bunch of other ones, but maybe just one more, subtree isomorphism. Given two trees, sort of unrooted, undirected trees, can you take one tree and embed it in the other one? Okay. Turns out um, that all three of these reduce, all reduce to matching 
uh, in parallel in NC. So very quickly in parallel. So if you have a if you have a fast parallel algorithm for the corresponding matching problem, then you get fast parallel algorithm for this. Randomized, randomized, deterministic to deterministic. All right, so that's kind of that's that's what I that's what I've got. I'm, I could certainly add to this list. What I could do today, certainly, what I thought I'd do today, is um, do uh, augmenting path. That's pretty easy, and certainly I can do these two. And I think I will try to do that. That takes a bit more work. Uh, <coughs> Any other, any, any, anything you, you're dying to see or dying not to see? All right, I'll today? just make it. Yeah, just today. And then tomorrow I'll get to other stuff. I don't know, I really have no idea how much of this I'm going to get to. And I doubt if I'll get to all of it. And maybe I'll, maybe I'll make some substitutions tomorrow, depending on how it goes today. So. All right. So I think, uh, let's, let's go with the few cycles lemma. That's probably the easiest. And then we'll do, um, then we'll do the isolation lemma and then equisaturation. Okay. So it, we start with actual result of um, Teo and Co. And this is from 92. That's an H. And they show that, so given a graph G with N vertices and M edges, I'll use M and N always uh, to mean the number of vertices and edges. Um, There are no more than m squared many minimum length cycles. And here I, uh, of course, unweighted. There's no, there are no edge weights here. There are most n, n squared many minimum length cycles. So the proof of this, uh, and uh, so the proof of this is actually, there's just a, a picture to show you. So let, um, so proof, let L be minimum length of a cycle. And for the moment, just assume L is even. Okay, I'll talk about L being odd. It, it's, it's not a major change. So assume L is even for now. Okay. So if we have a minimum, if we have a cycle of length L, then you know, here, in, in a case like this, L is equal to 8. So look at opposite, look at the, op, the op, op, pick two opposite edges on this cycle and just call them M1 and M2, or sorry, e, E1 and E2, okay? So clearly you can do this with any minimum weight cycle. You can just pick two edges, but the point is, if you're given a pair of edges, E1 and E2, there can be at most one minimum length cycle that, is, uh, that has this property um, where E1 and E2 are on opposite sides of the cycle. So given, so claim, given pair of edges of edges, E1, E2, there is at most one cycle, one minimum length cycle
with E1 and E2 um, opposite each other on the cycle. Okay, I think maybe this is clear, but I'll, for completeness, I'll do it. Suppose not, suppose I actually, so I have E1 and E2, suppose there's some other cycle that shares E1 and E2 as opposite edges. Well, if you look at, say that, how many edges are there that's gonna be L, um, L over two minus one. Same thing over here, L over two minus one. If I, have a, uh, if I have another cycle, it has to differ on one of these two segments. So maybe it differs on the left one. So maybe it goes off this way. It has the same number of edges. Um, and then co goes down like that, something like that. Okay. Well, since it's different, it induces a cycle um, with the black edges and the green edges induce a cycle. The the green edges have at most this many edges in them because it's a minimum weight cycle, and the black edges have at most this many. So now you get a cycle of length um, twice this, which is L minus 2. So the length of this cycle is less than or equal to L minus 2, and that's a contradiction because L, um, L was minimum. Okay. Ah, so, you, right, so, um... Yeah, but still, you still get the contradiction, but you will have L minus 1, which is in this case. Yes, right, so you go, you go this way, if you, if you go this way, you could possibly include E2. Yeah, all right, yeah. So, actually, in, in, it looks like it, um... So now that makes me worry about the odd L case. So this certainly works for L being even. For the odd L case, I'm thinking maybe it, it's, um, you have to, might have to add something to this. So for the odd L case, um, let me put some more vertices on there. E1, you pick them as close to being opposite as possible. So this will be E2. Okay, and what else can share this? Um, uh, so this now has length L minus one all divided by two. Okay, and if you have, an, and, and, that, and this is shorter than that. Okay, so the worst case is the cycle, uh, you have a cycle that differs on this side. Okay, so in that case, um, you've got that induces a cycle of length twice this, which is L minus two, uh, L minus one. But now, if you have a cycle that uses E1 in the opposite yeah, way, it differs on both sides, so you are, you are e then it differs on both sides, yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, good, so any questions on that? All right. Uh, so let's see, what was next? Oh, so, th so our theorem is similar. So theorem So G is a graph. Suppose G has no cycles of length at most r, and here I want r to be even. Okay. Then g has at most n to the fourth many cycles of length up to 2r. Okay. This is what we use to, to iterate 
our algorithm, we only have to get rid of a few cycles by setting them non-zero circulation. All right, so, so here it's the same idea, essentially. So we just sort of adapted this idea that Teo and Co had. So the proof. is you have some cycle and now what you do is you select four anchor points around the cycle as equidistant as possible so that the distance in edges between adjacent anchor points, I'll call this U1, U2, U3, and U4, this distance is at most R over 2. And you can always do this. Okay, so this here, this is a cycle, this is a cycle of length, sorry, just any cycle. So I didn't set this up, let me, let me just say. Suppose for any cycle C of length at most 2R, choose U1, U2, U3, U4, such that distance between adjacent vertices, uh, vertices between adjacent vertices, successive vertices, I probably should use that word, U, U sub i is at most r over 2. Okay. And now, this is the same idea. So if you're now given a sequence, an ordered sequence of four vertices, there can be at most one such cycle that satisfies this property, that, can be, that, that the u's can be chosen this way. If there is another such cycle, uh, we just do the same thing. It has to differ on one of the four segments. Let's say this one. Okay, but that now that induces a cycle of length. So this has length r over 2. This has length so r over 2. Induces a cycle of length at most r. Okay, so. Um. Contradiction. Okay. So, given any, given any, uh, uh, um, given any set of four vertices, is the most one cycle that does this. And every for every cycle, you can choose such four vertices. So, the number of such cycles cannot exceed the number of choices of, of sequences of four vertices, and that's clearly n to the fourth. Okay. So. Um, I said that, that's on tape, so I won't bother writing it. All right, any questions? Okay, good. All right, um, so that was that piece. So this is kind of like a survey. Um, so what was the next thing? Isolation. Isolation lemma, yes, yes. So this doesn't mention graphs at all. I'll start over here. I'll go. I'll go uh, cyclically. And I think this is. Um, I think this is originally the Momolian Vazirani and Vazirani who, who had this. This is their lemma. Um, so let S be any finite set. Uh, with M elements. And let uh, Oh, and I call, I call, I'll call this M. 
be a set system on S. So a family of subsets of S. Okay. So choose a weight function W from S into K for just for some K. That's at least m. Okay. Uh, uniformly at random. Some fi uh, fix fixed k. So k is fixed. K is a fixed parameter in this theorem. Just choose one of these weight functions uniformly at random. Um, this will be useful. We'll say, we'll say that W is isolating if there is a unique minimum weight set in M. with respect to W. Okay. Where the weight of a set is just the sum of the weights of the elements of the set as normal. Okay, then if we choose one of these uniformly at random, then the probability that W is isolating is at least um, m by k. Yeah. Okay. Does everyone here, anyone here actually know this lemma? Okay. You do? Does okay. it mean that it is always positive? Hmm? If the probability is greater than some positive number, then it is always positive. Uh, K is at least M. Oh wait, no, no, no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. No. I, I'm sorry. I, I didn't get this right. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't say this right. I think what I want to say is that the the chances that W is not isolating. Sorry. Okay. I yeah. Uh okay. All right. We, you, you, look, can we talk afterwards? Pardon me. For Schwarz Vitor Lemo, everybody knows. Yeah. Let, let, let's see the proof and then we can decide. It's Schwarz Vitor Lemo. Oh, with respect to W, the, the weight function W. Uh, well, for any family, you know, take any family F. That's the w weights uh, of M sets among the W weights. Maybe the, the first W should be the uh, figure um, the brackets. Yeah. It's a the family of W is isolating so if. Not family, mm -hmm. weight function. Weight function. The family weight function. The set of this uh, weight function. When One is. So when you talk both, I cannot understand. So okay. W is a function. Yes. So, right. 
w is isolating if there is a unique minimum weight set. Yeah, and w so weight set, and yeah, I probably set. did not even need to say this because that's the only way to define what a weight, what the weight of a set is. It's my only. It's the only weight function I'm talking oh, about. Oh, so it means that um, we say the uh, part of the sentence means that um, the weight is respect uh, to W, so we count the degrees respect to this function. Yeah, now I get. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. So I'll prove this. So I, uh, this is not the original proof. This is, this is a proof that I kind of came up with. So uh, it has not been refereed. Uh, so first of all, what I want to assume, so a given, so given a set system, so a set system um, S and, and M, I'm going to assume, and this is without loss of generality, that for every element A in S, there exists um, um, a T1 and a T2 in M such that A is in T1 and A is not in T2. So every every element is in one of these sets and not in some other set. So why, is this, why can we assume this without loss of generality? Well, because suppose that, first of all, there are two cases. Suppose that A is, is in none of the set systems, okay? Then the weight that you assign to A has no effect at all on the weights of the sets. So it has no effect at all on whether the weight function is isolating. So you can just ignore it, okay? Similarly, if A is in all of the sets, well, the weight function now does depend on the weight of A, but notice if you change the weight of A, you're changing the weight of all the sets at once, either up or down. That's not, that does not affect uh, whether the, whether the weight function is isolating or not either. So you might as well ignore those, those, those elements as well and just assume that they don't exist. All right, so now I define, so definition, uh, let W be some weight function. Um, I'll say that A is in, A in S is ambiguous. If you look at the minimum weight um, among all the sets that contain A and the minimum weight of all the sets that do not contain A, if those two minima are equal, we'll say that A is ambiguous. So if the minimum of the weight of T such that A is in T and T is in M, I mean, is equal to the minimum of T A not in T and T in M. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. I thought WT and I wrote the wrong thing. Okay.
All right, so um, the first thing to notice is that if there is, um, if there is an ambiguous element, then W is not isolating. So if an ambiguous A exists, I'm so, uh, let me see if I get that right. Um, no, other way around. Sorry. If W is not isolating, then some ambiguous A And um, this is not too hard to see. So if you have, let's suppose, T1 not equal to T2 have minimum weight. Then just pick any A. I'm sorry? They both have, assuming, I'm assuming W is not isolating. So I have two different elements of the system that both have minimum weight. And take the three out of the minimum weight. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, both, so assume, let uh, both have minimum weight. Mm -hmm. Then just pick any A in the um, symmetric difference of the two. And then certainly uh, the minimum of, uh, of T1, which is, uh, uh, is equal to the minimum, well, if, let's suppose, without loss of generality, A is in T1, A is not in T2. Then uh, this minimum is the same as the weight of T1, because T1 is a global minimum. This minimum is the same as T2, because T2 is a global minimum. Okay, so these two things are equal. Okay. All right, so now all we have left is just to bound the probability that there exists uh, ambiguous, uh, ambiguous element. And that's easy enough because it's very easy to determine what's the, given, given an element A, what's the probability that that a is ambiguous. So uh, fix an A. So when is A ambiguous? Uh, so consider, so split up, split up the sets, split up the set system into the sets which do contain A and the sets which don't contain A. So, and let's plot their weights. So these are weights of sets containing A. And on this line, I'll put the weights of sets not containing A. Okay. And uh, so, Maybe I have these, these things, all right. So these are the weights of the sets that contain A, and here are the weights of the sets that don't contain A. Okay, and there, there could be duplicates here, that's fine. All right. So, um, A being ambiguous means if you take the leftmost point on both these lines, they line up vertically. Okay, so A ambiguous means this is true. This, this is what happens when A is ambiguous. All right. Now just imagine you fixed all the weights, just fix all the weights, all the, all the weights assigned to elements not equal to A, and just look, just choose the weight of A last. So if you choose the weight of A last, notice that if you, let's say you take some weight of A, 
if you say increase the weight of A, what you're doing is you're shifting the points in this line over to the right by the amount that you change the weight of A. And if you decrease the weight of A, you're shifting those points to the left. So notice that there could be only one possible setting, at most one possible setting of the weight of A that makes them line up exactly right. So they line up, up vertically for at most. Because it's possible they, they never line up vertically because the weight you need to make them line up vertically is out of range. But so at most, one choice of the weight of A. Okay, that's what ma will make A ambiguous. And A, and if, th if they don't line up, then A is not ambiguous. So this only happens with one, at most one out of any, at every K choices cho chosen <coughs> uniformly. So therefore, the probability that A is ambiguous is at most 1 over k. And now the probability that there exists an ambiguous A is just bounded by the, by the sum bound here. So the probability that um, there exists an am ambiguous A is less than or equal to the sum over all A the probability that A is ambiguous, which is um, A and S. So this is just uh, less than or equal to M over K. Okay, and, and because of this, we know that now the probability W not isolating So that gives you everything. That's the whole. So it, the, this is used just you. Uh, uh, um, the set system in question, as it's as it's used, is just uh, the ground set is just the edge set of the graph, and the set system will be the just the set of perfect matchings of the graph and. And we choose k to be 2m. So in application, I'll just mention this. Uh, applied to um, perfect matching, uh, uh, algorithms in parallel randomized uh, NC. I guess that's RNC. So S is the edge set of the graph, of the graph G. And M is the set of perfect matchings. G. Uh, and the edge set of the, 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 this is size M. So we let K be 2M. And so W is isolating uh, with probability at least. Um, m over 2m, one half, okay. All right. Questions? Okay, so let's, maybe we, I'll, I'll we'll chat afterwards about, okay.
All right, so I think what was next? Uh, this I can, I've got till, let's see, I started at 610, so 730? Yes. Okay, all right. I can certainly do this very quickly. So if you have a matching that's not maximal, there's an augmenting path. Yeah? Um, yeah, it's for bipartite. Let me think about that for a second. You have a version of the isolation lemma you use for general graphs as well. And I believe it's the same. The same? Yeah. I believe. Uh, I, I, I'm not 100% sure of that. Um, it's been a while since I looked at the, the Svensson and Tarnowski paper. I think this is, I think that, well, this this will certainly isolate a, 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 a minimum weight perfect matching even for general graphs. Oh, so this is general. Yeah, G, G is a general graph. So, in our case, we. It's in randomized algorithms because you should calculate not determinant by partial. Okay, so here is for this, this proof is for general graphs. I just uh, is this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, that's the other thing that I, 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 I didn't write down. The connection to determinants, uh, matching to determinants, which is also important, both in the general case and in the bipartite case. Uh, yeah? Yeah, so now when I interpret the graph, I didn't get which W will consider, or arbitrary double. So here W is chosen uniformly at random from, so each edge, is given a weight between 1 and 2m, independently, uniformly, independently of the other edges. Okay, and uh, what's uh, the sense of uh, this result in terms of graph of perfect matching? So we know this is the minimum weight. So this, so, um, ah, sorry, so I, I, sh I should say what this means. So you find there's a unique minimum weight perfect matching with probability at least a half. So, uh -huh. so. perfect matching with probability at least a half. Um, if you have the right determinant and if you have a unique minimum weight matching, you could make it so that the term corresponding to that unique matching doesn't cancel with anything else. Okay. So you, all right. All right. Um, so let's just, uh, let's just do some basic uh, augmenting paths. I think that this is pretty straightforward, and I think probably most of you have seen this at one point or another. Uh, showing that if you have a non-maximal, if you have a non-maximum cardinality per, uh, uh, matching in a graph, some augmenting path exists with respect to that matching. Okay. I'm doing it because it also introduces some basic concepts that, are, that might be useful later. So just some definitions. So, uh, so G is a graph, you know, an arbitrary graph. Um, M, a matching. So M, so G, Has an edge set, has a vertex set, an edge set. Here, M is we we think of M as a set of edges. Um, such such that uh, so no two edges share an endpoint. So we'll say an edge is matched 
an edge E is matched if E is an M. And otherwise, E is free. We'll say the same for vertices. So a vertex V in uh, big V is matched if V, uh, if, um, if UV, I'll write it that UV is an M for some U. So some match, uh, it's the endpoint of some match edge, and otherwise V is free. Okay. So given M, uh, a path is augmenting, a simple path. If one, two things, both its endpoints are free. And uh, f uh, matched and free edges alternate along the path. All right, so I will use um, I will use uh, green to mean free, and I'll use black to be matched. So an augmenting path, um, it will it will have odd length, and that'll be matched. That'll be matched, and then this will be free. Free, free, and the endpoints are not are also free. So, okay. So that's an augmenting path. If you have an augmenting path in in uh, if you have a matching and you have an augmenting path, you can always increase the size of the matching by swapping the the bl the black and green edges. Okay, because this is free, there's no problem making this a black edge. And then, but then you have to make this green, and then that'll be black, and then that'll be green, and then that'll be black. And now you've got one more uh, matched edge than you had before. So if, uh, um, if, G is not, uh, if, if M is not um, maximal in terms of cardinality, then, I'm sorry, if, if an augmenting path exists, then M is not maximal in terms of cardinality. But the converse is also true, and that's what I'll just show. It's not, it's not hard. So. So theorem, G is not maximal, uh, sorry, not maximum cardinality, G, sorry, M is not maximum cardinality, if and only if an augmenting path exists. So one direction is obvious, you have an augmenting path, so the reverse direction, we done, so proof, done, okay, so we'll do the forward direction now. So suppose, so M is not maximal, not maximum. So there's a bigger, uh, uh, there's a bigger um, um, 
matching. So let M prime be a matching with M prime strictly bigger than the size of M. Okay. Uh, let's let, um, we're going to let, um, I will use, I'm, I'm going to do the same thing, I'm going to, I'm going to use black edges for M, but now I'll use green edges for M prime. So what we're, we're going to look at, consider the symmetric difference of these two matchings. So consider M plus M prime. What does this consist of? Well, you have um, M prime is bigger, so you, you have some, there's going to be a green edge in there. So there it is. Okay. Now, if these two are free with respect to M, then you're done. Here's an augmenting path of length one. So let's assume that these vertices are not free. So they're matched by M. So this one is going to go somewhere. And this one is going to go somewhere. Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe just one of them is, is matched and the other, one's, the other one still might be free. Okay. So let's suppose this one is matched. So you're going to get to this vertex here. Um, at this point, um, I want to say that there's an extension now. Okay. Well, all right, you can have this. This is one possibility. You can, have ed you can have paths that look like this. That's just fine. You can also have paths that maybe look like this. So here, um, the, these two are both free in... Uh, I'm not sure. It may, it may or may not exist. Yeah, but what, what I think that what we can say is that the number of green edges is greater than the number of uh, black edges. Mm -hmm. So probably you can just split them into two paths, and there is a path where the number of green edges is greater than the number of... Yeah, that's, that's, that's just what I want to say. So, I mean, you could, have, you could have edges that look like this. And you can have edges that are balanced, that you know, have a black on one side and a green on the other. And you could also have cycles. So you could have even length cycles that alternate black and green edges. But the point is they, ha they all alternate. The endpoints is a different story, but they all alternate. So this will be, and now I need to do this. Uh, do, do. Okay. So, uh, so a cycle has the same number of green edges and black edges. This one has more black edges than green edges. This one has more green edges than black edges. And balance cycles have the same number. So you've got to have one that has more green edges than black edges. And that'll be an augmenting path. Okay. So you just keep going until you can't alternate anymore. And those are the maximal paths. All right. So I don't want to write that down. Shall, shall I write that down? Maybe you shall repeat something. Okay. Sorry. All right. Yeah. Let, let the discrepancy is equal to the number of green minus the number of black along a path. So here the discrepancy is plus one. Here it's minus one. Here it's zero. And if I have a pa path that starts with black and ends with green somewhere, that's also zero. Okay. In the symmetric difference, there have to be more green edges than black edges because M prime is bigger. Um, and uh, so we're just, we're just ignoring the edges common to both. Yeah. 
belongs to M prime or? Yeah, green edge is, uh, I'll say, yeah, I better say this. So green edge belongs to M prime and black edges are from M. And there are no other edges. You can only have cycles and paths here. You can't have any vertex of degree three because what, what's the, if you have an edge coming down here, what can the color be? It can't be green and it can't be black because then you don't have a matching. So if you, if you just, if you throw away all the edges except the ones that are in the symmetric difference of these two, then you just get paths and cycles. So you don't have any, you don't have any vertex of degree bigger than two at that point. So now you just, and they're all alternating. So you can't have the same color twice in a row on a path and it's not a matching. Okay, so either a path has uh, imbalanced favors the green by one, uh, favors the black by one, or doesn't, or is unbiased. And because all that we're taking in the symmetric differences, we're just taking out the edges that coincide, that belong to both. In the symmetric difference, you, ha you have more green edges than black edges because you had more green edges to start with. So there has to be, there has to be a positive bias somewhere. Well, no, you could, you could have this case. That if you do, then you even have to have more of these. So let's suppose you had three paths that looked like this. Then you have to have at least four paths that look like that to compensate. Yeah, because the sum of sides should be positive. Right. Yeah. So that's why we have at least one dimensional path. Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. So. The, so there's more than one sequential algorithm that follows this template. Start with a matching, in fact, start with the empty matching. Find an augmenting path and then swap it. So an augmenting path, for, for the empty matching, an augmenting path is just a single edge. And just, uh, you know, exchange the, exchange the, 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 free, free, exchange free with uh, uh, matched edge along the path and then you increase it by one and just keep doing this until you, until no more augmenting paths exist. So this is how the, um, this is how CARP's algorithm for bipartite graphs works. And this is how Edmund's algorithm works for general graphs. Uh, CARP, CARP's algorithm is, is fairly easy. Um, the whole problem with this is finding an augmenting path, Check, checking to see if there is one. That's where all the hard part comes in. With CARP, it's not, it's not so difficult, but with Edmonds, it, 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 it really is quite involved. Um, I think I don't have time to do the equisaturation -satur theorem, so I'm, I'm going to put that off until tomorrow. What I will do is I can mention how CARP's algorithm works for, it's a simple, it's fairly simple. Um, it doesn't involve network flows. That's sort of the standard one that I learned when I was in school. So CARPS, I'll go for a maximum, maximum in terms of cardinality. Bipartite matching. Okay, and it follows this template. So um, look for an augmenting path, and then augment it. That's what we'll say. Augmenting the path is switching the switching the edges. All right. So. Um,
So here's a bipartition. So I have left vertices, I'll call that those L, and I'll call those R. Um, all right, now suppose you, you start with some matching, which presumably is not maximum, and then you want to find an augmenting path. So that matching is going to have edges between L and R. So the graph G is undirected. But here's what we're now going to do. We are going to impose a direction on the edges. So we'll impose an orientation on the edges as follows. Um, if I have a matched edge, okay, so again, black will mean matched and green will mean unmatched, uh, free, I'll just say free. Um, I'm going to orient the matched edge edges from left to right. And the free edges I'm going to orient from right to left. So there could be lots of these. So here's one. Um, here's another. And here's another. And there's one. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll put one in here. All right. So, look at the free edges in R with respect to the original graph. So, the unmatched edges, uh, uh, sorry, the, not the edges, the vertices. The free vertices in R where are they? These two are free, and uh, this one's free. Okay. And uh, look at the free edges in L. Where are they? Um, there's this one. Uh, this oh, they're they're spread out. Okay, so these are free. So we know that an augmenting path exists. Um, it has to start with a free vertex. And the first edge that it, uh, um, the first edge is going to be green. So it turns out any, it turns out any augmenting path is going, can, is going to start on the right and correspond to a directed path through the directed graph start on the right, and eventually end up on the left because it has odd length. Okay. So you can think of an augmenting path as a directed path from a free vertex on the right to a free vertex on the left. Okay. So how do you find that? Well, you know one exists. You just look at each free vertex on the right and do depth first search <laughs> and see if you can find a directed path to a free vertex on the left. So this is just the reachability problem. And now to find it, you only have to do depth first search on at most n over, uh, well, at most n vertices. The, the bipartition could be lopsided. Um, at most n vertices. And uh, as soon as you find one, then you just augment it. So um, I'll just write that, uh, I'll just write all of that down. That's the whole algorithm. Um, where did my right one go? Okay, so, um, so an augmenting path can start on the right, start in R with a free vertex. And and in L free vertex. I mean, you can think of an augmenting path starting in L, 
but then you're just following one back, you're just following the path backwards. So you might as well just follow in the opposite direction. So start, start in R and then follow it that way. And now you just find one of these by um, depth first search. So So the algorithm looks like this. So for each uh, free vertex in R, do the following. Um, find a path using, say, depth first search or breadth first search, whatever search you want to do. Find a path uh, to a free vertex in L. And it's easy to detect that these things are free. Okay. And then augment it. And then um, break. I guess, sorry, loop up to there. Once you augment a path, you can start all over again. Okay, good. All right. Um, any questions? I've got time. Let me just state, oh, I guess um, we, we can end at 7.30. There's no problem. Let me just state the, uh, the equi, equisaturation theorem and show how it, maybe show how it implies Hall's theorem, but, well, I think that's actually going to be obvious once I, once I do it. So this is, this is bipartite. So um, G is equal to L R E uh, bipartite. Um, and here it's, uh, it's um, equally bipartite. So that, what that means is that you have the same number of nodes on the left as on the right. Okay, so there's, here there's a possibility that you could have a perfect matching, maybe. All right. Um, we say that G, uh, or so, uh, matching M in E is equally saturated if it is not a perfect matching. But if you add any edge um, to the graph G that's not there, then uh, you, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I'm, this is for G. Uh, all right, let me, t let me start it again. G is equally saturated. If G does not have a perfect matching, but adding any single edge to G gives you a perfect matching. E uh, to the edge set E uh, uh, produces a perfect matching. You mean allows for the existence? Allows, yes, allows for a perfect matching. So there is a perfect matching. You add, throw that edge in, and now there is a perfect matching. So uh, allows So it is a maximally non-perfectly matchable graph. <laughs> Maximal in the inclu edge inclusion. OK. Um, so it turns out that if G is equally saturated, and here's the theorem, it has a, it has a very nice form. So here's the, here's the theorem. If G is equally saturated, then G has to look like this. Um, uh, 
there's a partition of the left vertices into two sets, L1 and L2, and I'll just arrange them like this. And there's a partition of the right vertices into two sets, R1 and R2, such that the following is true. All possible edges from L2 are, are present between L2 and R2, so all possible. All possible edges are present between L1 and R2. And finally, all possible edges between L1 and R1. The only thing we, we don't, and there are no edges from L2 to R1 at all. So I'll just say between these two, no edges. So the very, and, and finally, one more thing. L2 is, is bigger than R2 in size. That's other, that's, that, so that's the statement of the theorem. So you get this amazingly structured, it basically only looks like one thing. The only choice you have are these partitions and then all the edges are determined. So I guess I'll start with this tomorrow. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. So <laughs> actually L t L1 and R1 are com is complete bipartite. Yeah. L1 and R2 is complete bipartite. L2 and R2 is complete uh -huh. bipartite and L2 R1 is empty. Yeah. If you draw a matrix, you have zero three blocks with ones and one block with zeros. Yeah. Okay. So I'll I'll start with this next time. <laughs>